good evening everyone so i'm dr deepak and uh, i welcome you all to this pulmonology session so in this session we'll try to cover a few important topics in pulmonology and in for part 1 ex mrcp examination for in respiratory medicine you have 15 questions right out of the 200 questions 15 questions will be from uh, respiratory medicine and in that 15 questions you can expect at least about eight questions from these four topics that is asthma, COPD, pulmonary embolism, and pneumothorax. So you can see the weightage uh, of these four topics, right? So most uh, mostly they will be concentrating on the diagnosis and management aspect related to these topics. Yes, and do not try to go in detail about the pathogenesis or the pathology involved in these conditions. Just try to understand how the patient is going to present to you, how the patient is going to present to the clinic, how you are going to diagnose, right? And how you are going to treat and what the recent guidelines says. Okay. Understanding the recent guideline is very important for your MRCP exams. Okay. So I'll try to cover all the recent guidelines, okay, pertaining to, to, to these topics. First, let us try to understand about the asthma. So here we'll see the criteria. Okay, for the diagnosis, we'll see these few points about the diagnosis, categorization of this condition, the treatment options, and how we can prevent it. And there are a few variants of asthma which, which we need to understand. And we'll try to solve a bit of questions. Okay, all right. So when it comes to respiratory medicine, the first thing we need to understand is whether the pathology involved is either obstructive pathology or restrictive pathology. Right. So it's the obstructive condition or the restrictive condition which, which we need to understand. So based on that, the diagnosis will be. So when it comes to obstructive causes, we have three important causes. You can remember if from A, B, C, A for asthma, B for bronchiectasis and C for COPD. One more uh, obstructive condition is you see in case of bronchiolitis obliterans. So the first three are very important, asthma, COPD and bronchiectasis. Okay, and when it comes to the symptom, the presentation of these obstructive conditions can be a bit different how a restrictive lung diseases will present. So these we are going to understand based on the history itself. So understanding the presentation and the history is very important in these conditions. So you, you have to understand how the patient is going to present to us. So in the questions, that is what is going to be mentioned. So when it comes to asthma, it is, it, there is no one particular definitive test that tells you that, yes, the patient is having asthma. So basically, you are trying to understand the presentation, the presenting complaints of the patients, how the patient is presenting, how the symptoms are, right? And a detailed history. Other than that, you are going to do some investigations to rule out the other conditions, right? And even the imaging test that we are going to do is to rule out the other conditions. So once... Uh, once you collaborate all these, you're going to come to a diagnosis of patient having asthma. Okay. So the British Thoracic Society tells we can think of asthma. The high prob probability of asthma is when the patient is having all these typical features. That is recurrent episodes of symptoms. Like that is recurrent attack of the uh, symptoms. And the V's which can be confirmed by a healthcare professional, a positive uh, family history of atopy or the patient's history of atopy, a historical uh, record of variable airflow obstruction, and the patient is not having any features which suggest of alternative diagnosis. So when the patient is having all these features, we can think of asthma rather than some other conditions. Intermediate probability is when the patient is not having all these features and the patient is having poor response to the initial trial of treatment. Okay, so what is this initial trial of treatment? I'll come to that in the next slides. And we call it as low probability when none of the features are there in the patient and most of the features suggest of some other alternative diagnosis rather, rather than an asthmatic attack. Okay, so we can think of asthma or the increased possibility of asthma is when the patient is presenting with a wheeze or breathlessness and the cough he is having is nocturnal in nature yes and sometimes he is getting symptoms after exercise there is chest tightness and cough which is worse at the night or early morning okay and he is getting symptoms after some allergen exposure uh, right and he has some history of some medications like beta blockers of aspirin and the symptoms have started after the um, 
after putting the patient on beta blockers of aspirin is one more history that is important. Then any history of atopic disorders or eczema in the family and V's which is heard on auscultation and unexplained peripheral blood eosinophilia. So we have to see for all these features. In this, the most important is cough. Okay, Mostly the patient will present with a dry cough, which is worse at the night or early morning cough. Okay, And the patient might come and tell you the uh, V's. Okay, the patient can tell that they can hear their own uh, breathing. Right, sometimes the patients uh, the symptoms will be worse after exercise or exposure to the dust or a particular allergen. So the history is very important when it comes to diagnosing asthma. Okay, and if the patient is presenting with some other added symptoms, for example, if the patient is having productive cough. And, and the patient is not having any wheeze or breathlessness, then we should not be thinking in terms of asthma. It can be because of some other uh, respiratory condition. It can be because of a COPD patient, COPD, right? And on repeatedly or having normal physical examination and the patient is having significant smoking history. So that in turn suggests that the, it might be because of COPD and not asthma, right? And other features like patients having prominent dizziness, lightheadedness, peripheral tingling. So all these decrease the possibility that the patient is having any asthmatic attack okay all right so when it comes to management so this is where the money is in for your exams almost all the questions are going to come up for the management of the asthmatic condition okay so when, based on the history when you are thinking of asthma where there's a high probability that the patient is having asthmatic symptoms then we are going to give offer a trial of treatment okay what treatment options are there i'll come to that if there is low probability where you are not thinking in terms of asthma, then we'll have to investigate or we have to treat the other possible condition. Intermediate probabilities where we need to do further investigations to confirm the underlying condition. The most important test is the pulmonary function test. In pulmonary function test, we mainly want to see the forced uh, expiratory volume. That is in the first second of post expiratory volume and post vital capacity. These two are very important aspect when it comes to diagnosing uh, obstructive uh, lung pathologies. Okay, so what we do is here we take a ratio of post expiratory volume in the first second and the post vital capacity. And if that ratio is less than 0.7 or 70%, then it indicates that the patient is having any obstructive etiology for the symptoms. In that case, we have to start the patient on the treatment. So the trial of treatment will start when we find that FE1, FEC ratio is point, less than 0.7. If the ratio is more than 0.7, then we might have to do further investigations to confirm the diagnosis. All right. And one more important clue in terms of diagnosis is uh, after the patient is given a salbutamol, that is short-acting beta agonist, uh, 400 microgram of inhaled sal salbutamol after it is given, if there is an improvement in the forced vital, the forced expiratory volume by more than 400 ml, then that significantly indicates that the person is having some kind of airway obstruction. So that again increases the probability of the asthmatic attack rather than any other lung pathologies. Okay, so the ratio of FE1 to FEC ratio is important and the trial of so, uh, short acting beta agonist that is salbutamol inhalation and we see for the improvement in the airway obstruction okay. okay other than that the peak expiratory flow rate is also important when it comes to diagnosing the asthma condition okay here the peak expiratory flow rate tells you that it's a volume of air that is forcefully expelled from the lungs in one quick exhalation and is a reliable indicator of ventilation capacity as well as the airflow obstruction. So the airflow obstruction, you can get a clue based on the FE1, FEC ratio like we saw in the previous slide, right? So this peak expiratory flow rate tells us about the ventilation adequacy of the patient. Okay, And this is important. So uh, peak expiratory flow rate has a bit of importance when diagnosing asthma, but not in case of COPD. I'll come to that when we are when we are seeing for COPD. So in asthma, even COP peak expiratory flow rate is important for the diagnosis. Okay, in peak expiratory flow rate, we would like to see for the diurnal variation of the symptoms. So basically, what happens in asthma patient? The uh, 
obstruction is more severe during the night or when they are exposed to cold weather okay mostly because of the decrease in climatic temperature during the night time the symptoms are worse during the night hours than compared to the daytime so that difference of more than 20 percent in peak expiratory flow rate is what we want to detect in the patient for diagnosing so in that case peak expiratory flow rate it shows if it shows more than 20 percent of variation then it is one of the diagnostic criteria for the diagnosis okay and other than that we can go for skin prick test that can confirm if any allergy uh, is involved in, in the patient which can be a trigger factor so when it comes to important tests that we would like to do in case of an asthma patient is one is spirometry where we want to see for the fe1 uh, fec ratio then one then is uh, peak expiratory flow rate yes then we'd like to do go for skin prick test laboratory data is of not much importance although you can see for any raised is eosinophils which tells you about the allergic manifestation or neutrophilia if there is any acute exacerbation of asthma which because of some underlying infections okay and imaging test also doesn't have much role although the x-rays might help us to exclude the other pathologies okay and it also might help us to uh, see for any signs of infections in case of acute exacerbation of asthma right? any signs of inflammation or consolidation in case of pneumonia that we see okay so basically these are the investigations that we see for in case of asthma patient other than that there is something called as direct challenge test so this is done only when there is no evidence of airflow obstruction on initial assessment right and the other objective tests are inconclusive, but asthma still remains one of the important uh, possibility of the diagnosis. Only in that condition, we can go for direct challenge test or else it is not indicated. So in this test, basically it is done with the uh, histamine or the metacholine, which are bronchoconstrictors. So once these uh, medications are given to the patient, we see for the FE1 concentration. Okay, if it is less, if it remains less than 8 mg per ml, then the test is regarded as positive. So it's not that important clinically, not routinely done. So basically the diagnosis will be done with these investigation itself based on the FE1 or FEC ratio and peak expiratory flow rate itself. And most important is the history. Okay. And allergen test is important. So in skin prick, other than skin prick test, we have to see for the blood eosinophilia of more than 4%. Raised allergen specific immunoglobulin that is immunoglobulin E, uh, with a that can collaborate with the history of atopic status. So this atopy is a condition where immune response, okay, where there is a predisposition of an immune response against a diverse antigens and allergens, and there is overproduction of immunoglobulin E, and the clinical consequences is an increased propensity to this hypersensitivity reaction so in case of atopy what happens is is a immunological response of our body to the diverse antigens and allergens and the patient can present in the form of atopic rhinitis or allergic asthma symptoms or atopic dermatitis right and the investigation wise you will see eosinophilia in the lab values other than that uh, lymphocyte studies can show CD4, CD8 count and suppressor T cell count that might be lower than the standard value. So the CD4 and CD8 count can be reduced and uh, this radioallergen sorbent test can help to determine the specific IgE antibodies. So the history of atopy is very important in case of asthma patients because if the patient has any of these atopic dermatitis or atopic rhinitis and now the patient has presented with the respiratory symptoms, then we can think of atopy as one of the cause for the asthma okay like i said history and examination is very important right so in the history you need to know any the previous history of asthma for example a patient if they are having a childhood asthma then they are always at risk of developing any asthmatic attack even in the adulthood right so history of asthma is important other than that any family history of atopic disease exposure to the allergens right like any dust dust mite pets in the home and exposure to certain irritants like tobacco smoking or any personal history of atopic disease for example eczema or allergic rhinitis and exposure to cold air or any particulates and in some cases even the emotions like stress and anxiety can also exacerbate the asthma symptoms yes and 
and the clinical features uh, clinical features that the patient can have difficulty in breathing sometimes they can present with a wheeze right the wheeze and dyspnea can be so uh, so pronounced that patient can wake up from the sleep the symptoms of chest tightness and the symptoms being worse at the night or in the early morning hours yes that is very characteristic of a asthma patient okay and spew patient can have a history of single or multiple polyps in the nasal cavity which again tells you about the allergic nature of this condition so in the history we have to see for all these uh, symptoms okay and the investigation wise we saw what all investigations we need to do okay and other than that the other risk factors for this condition would be some positive family history and history of eczema atopic dermatitis allergic rhinitis we saw that and smoking is also an in a risk factor for developing asthma and it can worsen the prognosis okay it can impact how the patient is going to respond to the different medications and other than that if the patient is having a reflex disease or obesity or obstructive sleep apnea that can also be a risk factor for the asthma okay so in exam uh, for your part one mostly the three uh, the questions will be based on the next these two slides okay so the treatment chronology is very important so any patients once you are diagnosed with the asthma so first this like i said the first most important thing is the history okay what history the patient is presenting with and how the simple way of presentation is particular to a asthma patient okay next is bit of investigations the spirometry values peak expiratory flow rate values next is the management okay in the management the first line of agent the first line of agent here would be short acting beta agonist okay so you're going to start the patient on the salbutamol okay or terbutol in salbutamol is a preferred agent okay inhalational salbutamol is what we have to start the patient with okay that is the first step okay even with this the patient is not responding then we are going to go to the second line of drug that is we are going to add a inhalational corticosteroids okay the saba the saba which we had started before can be still continued and can be given whenever the patient is in need of it but if the patient is not responding well to the salbutamol next step is to add a inhalational corticosteroids if still the patient is not responding then the next step is to add a long acting beta antagonist okay long acting beta antagonist long acting beta agonist that is along with that we have we have to still continue the saba as needed by the patient or another mode of treatment in this case would be with the mart therapy that is maintenance and reliever therapy where along with the laba that is long acting beta agonist you are going to add a inhalational corticosteroids okay so do remember this uh, initially you'll start the treatment with the salbutamol then you'll go with the inhalational corticosteroids with short acting beta agonist next step is you'll go with the long acting beta agonist with saba as needed or you're going to switch on to the maintenance and reliever therapy where you're going to add inhalational corticosteroids to the long acting beta agonist still if the patient is not responding then you can go on to increase the dose of the inhalational corticosteroids okay so this is where you're going to increase the dose okay not just when you just added the inhalational corticosteroids with the saba the next step if they are asking you the question what would be the next step here you are not going to increase the dose okay first you are going to add a long acting beta agonist see how the patient is responding or you are going to add this inhalational steroids with, with long acting beta agonist see how the patient responds still the patient is not responding well that is when you are going to increase the dose of inhalational steroids right or you are going to increase the inhalational uh, steroid dose or you are going to add a leukotriene receptor antagonist okay that is the last step okay so adding a leukotriene receptor antagonist it should be the last option in the management of asthma so this is entirely based on the nice guideline and this is what is going to be asked in your exams okay so based on the history it would be very easy for you to diagnose the condition okay so you will have a conclusion by reading the question itself that they are asking you about the asthma so the next uh, question the main question would be about the management plan okay so this is the management plan so how you are going to start and what drugs you will be adding in order to relieve the symptoms 
okay and other than this management even the non pharmacological management plays a vital role in uh, in treating asthma where we have to educate the patient on avoidance of the tobacco smoking and avoidance of the exposure uh, allergens okay and occupational asthma i'll, I'll come to that there's a separate slide for that we'll go to that slide later and we have to avoid the medication if medic one of the medication is the culprit there for example beta blockers and few nsids can also exacerbate the asthmatic attack okay they can cause the asthma symptoms so such medications need to be avoided okay and sometimes even the exercise can induce asthma which is known as exercise induced asthma in that case uh, a proper graded exercise technique is what the patient need to be following to avoid the exercise induced bronchoconstriction okay so patient has to be counseled even regarding that okay okay so anybody would like to answer this question so here we see that 25 year old man is admitted with dyspnea okay pulmonary function test reveal a reduced peak expiratory flow rate that is less than 55 percent below the normal range for his height and age he has no past medical history of note he smokes Five cigarettes per day and keeps a cat. Which of the following is the likely diagnosis? So what you have got here, a 25-year young man. Okay, he is having difficulty in breathing. Okay, pulmonary function test shows that peak expiratory flow rate is reduced. Right. Okay. Other than that, he has a smoking history. Okay, and that other than that, the patient has a cat in his home. So there is definitely a risk here. Right. Uh, presence of uh, pets in home is one of the important risk factor for the. Uh, allergic uh, manifestation in the patients and in that peak expiratory flow rate is reduced right so here can the bronchiectasis can be a possibility no right so how does the bronchiectasis patient present as they mainly will have cough with the copious amount of sputum which is not there in this patient there's no history of any structural abnormality here so this is not an option open cough is not an option because they doesn't have any symptoms of any acute infection right Carcinoma cannot be an option because there is no history of any weight loss. Okay, though he has a risk factor history of smoking, but there's no history of any weight loss here. So the remaining option here is the asthma, right? Asthma. Yeah. Right. So this peak expiratory flow rate is an indicator of the large uh, airway obstruction. So it helps in the measurement of this maximal force expiration expiration through a peak flow meter. So it helps to correlate well, even with the uh, post expiratory volume test that we do and is an important indicator of the uh, airway obstruction. Okay. All right. This is one more important slide. So based on the peak expiratory flow rate, we can classify uh, how severe the asthmatic attack is in the patient. Okay. We call it as moderate in severity if the PEFR is more than 50%. Okay, the patient's speech is normal, is comfortable at rest, respiratory rate is less than 25 and heart rate is less than 110. Okay, we, we call it as acute severe if the PFR is reduced to 30, 33 to 50%. Okay, patient is unable to complete the sentence that shows that the patient is a bit dysnic, right? The patient is a bit sick than compared to what the patient looked like in a moderate phase. Here the patient will be sick, he's unable to complete the sentence, he'll be dysnic here, and respiratory rate would be increased here. It would be more than 25 uh, rates per minute, and pulse rate will be more than 110. Okay. If PFR is more less than 33, oxygen saturation is dropping down, is less than 92. Okay, chest is silent. Okay, on auscultation, the patient has features of cyanosis. Okay, he has very feeble respiratory effort. Other than that, the patient is in bradycardia or hypotension or any arrhythmia. Okay. Other than that, the patient is exhausted, he is confused, or he is going into coma. So these all are the features of a life-threatening asthma. Now, why it is important for us to categorize the patient into acute, severe, and life-threatening asthma? So the only treatment for life-threatening asthma is the intubation. Okay. So life-threatening asthma is an indication that the patient is going into respiratory failure so later even if, if as the patient gets too tired even the adequate ventilation might not be possible right that is the reason if the patient is in the life-threatening phase then we'll go for the intubation okay and with the acute severe asthma patient can go into acute respiratory alkalosis okay 
and which can be associated with the hypoxia. So the patient is having hypoxia, reduced partial pressure of oxygen, reduced partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and a raised pH, that is alkalosis. So asthma is one condition where you see all these four findings. Other than this, uh, the other differential diagnosis where you see hypo hypocapnia, hypoxia, and alkalosis are one is pulmonary embolism, and one more is anxiety hypoventilation. Okay. So, the ABG values can be a bit same when it comes to acute severe asthma patient and pulmonary embolism patient as well. Okay. So, in your question, if you are getting hypoxia, okay, reduce partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide and alkalosis, think of these two possible diagnoses, acute severe asthma and pulmonary embolism. Okay. And in this slide, remember if any features are there of life-threatening features, Right, the saturation PEF for uh, percentile, bradycardia, hypotension, patient is confused, exhausted, is going into coma, then the only treatment modality is the intubating the patient. Okay. Okay. When it comes to occupational asthma, so here the main culprit will be the exposure the patient is exposed to in his workplace. Okay. For example, the most common uh, cause for this occupational asthma in the Western world is this uh, isocyanate cobalt. This has been asked in the exam previously. Isocyanate cobalt is the most common cause of the occupational exposure asthma, where uh, this is mainly found in this spray painting and foam molding, where they use this for adhesives. So this compound is found in these products. And other than this, the patient can also um, get this allergic uh, response to this platinum salts or soldering flux resins and epoxy resins or any floor. Okay. So among this, remember about the isocyanate cobalt being the most common cause and the and the job that is involved with it. Other than that, in order to diagnose this occupational asthma, it is important for us to establish the serial measurement of this peak expiratory flow rate. That is at home, also at the away from work. Okay, sorry, at work and away from the work. For example, in the history, if they have given you in the question, the patient has symptoms which are much more severe when the person is at his workplace okay, rather than when he's in home. Or one, one more history they can give is the patient has symptoms at his work, but the patient, uh, the symptoms got relieved and the patient went out on a holiday. Okay, So in that case, it indicates that the patient is having symptoms only at his workplace. So something related to his workplace is what might be responsible for his symptoms. And if the symptoms are suggestive of asthma, it is an occupational asthma is one of the possibility there. And the only treatment for occupational asthma is advising the patient on to the changing the job or you can refer the patient to the occupation, occupational therapist for, for any adaptation that might be required at his workplace. Okay. Okay. Coming to the next topic, uh, any doubt till now uh, in the asthma management? You guys want me to repeat any of the slides? I hope you have understood the management plan that is very important as per your exams. Okay. The management uh, chronology is what is going to ask in the exams. May, mainly they'll try to confuse you with the increasing the dose of uh, corticosteroids or adding a leukotriene antagonist. Remember that leukotriene antagonist is the last thing that you're going, going to do in a patient. Okay. So... Initially, you're going to start with a short-acting beta agonist. You're going to add a inhalational corticosteroids. Then you're going to add a long-acting beta agonist, right? Then you're going to increase the dose of inhalational steroids. Then you're going to add a leukotriene antagonist, okay? Try to remember this in this order, okay? And remember the treatment of life-threatening asthma. The treatment of moderate and acute severe asthma remains the same. We have to follow the same nice guidelines that, I, that we saw in the previous slides. Okay, all right. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, uh, COPD is characterized by chronic respiratory symptoms and airflow limitations. Often is a progressive condition, and once the damage sets in, it's usually a no, uh, not fully reversible condition. And when it comes to COPD, tobacco smoking is the main risk factor. Okay, and is responsible for about forty to seventy percent of COPD cases. And it mainly exerts its effect by causing the inflammatory response, the ciliary dysfunction, oxidative injury. 
and other than tobacco smoking the other uh, culprits can be air pollution indoor burning of biomass fuels occupational exposure to dust chemical agents and fumes right these are the other few etiologies that can be responsible for this condition so what happens is when the patient is uh, smoking for longer uh, for prolonged period uh, there is some kind of inflammatory response or damage to, or to the respiratory epithelial cells whenever this damage happens and there is an ongoing inflammation there is infiltration by the neutrophils and these neutrophils in turn release an enzyme that is protease and this protease is which is responsible for the destruction of the alveolar wall and other than that they can also induce the increased mucus secretion okay so these two is responsible for the overall pathology of the copd patients so they can either present with a chronic bronchitis right or they can present with the emphysema chronic bronchitis is where there is a chronic inflammation of the bronchial walls other than that there is a mucus hypersecretion here okay whereas in case of emphysema there is alveolar wall destruction okay and as these two sets in the tissue repair uh, won't be happening like how it is to happen in a normal individual there will be abnormal tissue repair and other than this the protease inhibitors the protease inhibitors are inhibited by the smoking as well so there is increased level of protease which is responsible for the pathogenesis okay and in the history cough is a very common symptom initially the patient uh, that this is a symptom the patient will have frequently a uh, morning cough is what patient will present with but as the disease progresses the patient will have a uh, constant coughing right? other than that uh, sputum uh, production is uh, is one that is quite common in copd patient and no matter what the pattern of sputum production is it always indicates that the patient is having a long standing copd so initially the patient can present with a dry cough as the disease progresses the patient will produce the productive sputum and the presence of productive sputum tells you that the patient is having a long standing disease and the patient can present with shortness of breath which initially can be with the exercises but as the disease progresses there can be shortness of breath even at the rest as well patient can have fatigue and weight loss as well okay and like in asthma patient we see the fe1 fec ratio will be less than 70% here or less than 0.7 or less than 70% but the total lung capacity remains normal okay this is typically seen in case of copd patients the ratio will be reduced but the low total lung capacity be remains normal and in the blood values okay in the lab values we see polycythemia here so when it comes to polycythemia we have got two types that is primary polycythemia and secondary polycythemia right primary polycythemia is where the erythropoietin level is decreased right secondary polycythemia is where the erythropoietin level is increased because of the hypoxia that is there in the patient so in case of copd what happens as there is no enough oxygenation the erythropoietin level will be increased and that in turn causes the more rbc production and hence patient end up with the secondary polycythemia and that is the reason why we see raised hematocrit here it will be more than 55% right so secondary polycythemia is what we see in case of a copd patient other than that patient can be anemic because of variety of reasons it can be because of the chronic infection or the chronic inflammation that is ongoing okay other than that if the patient developed any hemoptysis okay that can also be responsible for this and leukocytosis is because uh, can be because of the ongoing acute exacerbation of copd because of any underlying infection right and the oxygen saturation can be low and other than that this apg values is important the partial pressure of carbon dioxide will be increased it can be more than 50 and whereas partial pressure of oxygen will be less than 60 okay so these two values suggest us that the patient is in respiratory insufficiency all right okay and in chest x-ray we see hyper inflated lung okay that is because what happens in, in copd patients is uh, once the patient inhales the lungs expand and there is no proper recoiling of the lung so the air gets trapped within the lung and that is why we see the hyper inflated lungs hyper inflation is is when you see how you see for hyper inflation if the anterior ribs if you see if it is extending more than six anterior ribs then we call it as a hyperinflated lung. If you can count here, 
it is definitely more than six anterior ribs. So it's a hyperinflated lung X-ray. And the diaphragm will be flattened out. And because of the hyperinflation, you see increased intercostal spaces. Okay. And this glo uh, global initiative of COPD criteria, that is for the diagnosis, uh, not for the diagnosis, for the CVRT, okay, where we categorize the patient from mild to very severe based on the FE1. If it is more than 80, it's mild. 50 to 80 is moderate. 30 to 50 is severe. Less than 30 is very severe. Right. And one more thing to remember here is the FE1 is used for the assessment of the severity of the patient and not for the diagnosis. It is only for the severity of the patient. All right not for the diagnosis. And the peak expiratory flow rate is of limited value in COPD. Like I said you when I was telling about asthma patient, where their uh, peak expiratory flow rate will help us to categorize whether the patient is having, how, how is the severity of the condition, right? If it was less than 33%, we categorize him, the patient to be in life-threatening condition. Whereas BFR has no role in case of a COPD patient because they say that it's... A, Sometime it can underestimate the degree of airflow obstruction. So it is more, much more beneficial in asthma patients measuring a PEFR rather than in a COPD patient. In COPD patients, it is FE1 that is of more value than peak expiratory flow rate. Okay. Then acute exacerbation of COPD. This is something that, that is repeatedly asked in the exam. So the most common uh, bacterial organisms that can cause this infective exacerbation are H influenza. So overall, it is Haemophilus influenza that is the most common cause. And other than this, Streptococcus pneumoniae and Moraxella cateralis are the other common causes. Now, one more scenario that they ask in exam is if the patient has developed any pneumonia, okay, in that case, the common organism will be Streptococcus pneumoniae, not H influenza. Okay, remember this. If the patient is having any pneumonia symptoms, pneumonia signs, if the patient has been diagnosed with a pneumonia, then it is Streptococcus pneumonia that is the causative organism. If the patient is having just an acute uh, upper respiratory tract infection, okay, in that case, H influenza is the common cause. Okay. And other than this, even the viruses can cause acute exacerbation in that the human rhinovirus is the most common pathogen identified. Okay. So whenever the patient is having this acute exacerbation, the treatment is uh, as the patient will be already on the bronchodilators, we have to increase the frequency of this bronchodilator use. For example, if the patient is using it once a day, we can increase the frequency to twice or thrice a day when the patient is in this in infective exacerbation. Other than that, we need to add a steroids. We can add a prednisolone of the 30 mg at least for about two weeks. Okay. And antibiotics, we, we can add only if we find that sputum is purulent. Okay. Or there are clinical signs of pneumonia. Okay. That is clinical sciences. You can find a consolidation patch okay, or any uh, evidence of pneumonia on a imaging like chest x-ray or a CT scan. Okay, or any lab value showing the definitive evidence of pneumonia, then we'll go for the antibiotics. Okay, so these three are the important uh, modalities when treating the infective exacerbation. You have to increase the bronchodilator use. Okay, we are going to add steroids to the treatment chart. Then we are going to add an antibiotics if there is any signs of pneumonia. Right? If the patient is stable, okay, how we are going to manage a COPD patient? Okay, this. The next two slides are very important. Like how the management is important in asthma. Even here, the management is very important. This is where they're going to ask you questions. So initially, we'll start the patient on short-acting beta agonist. Okay. Short-acting beta 2 agonist or short-acting muscarinic antagonist. These two are the first-line agents. Okay. The salvitamol usual dose is 100 to 200 micrograms. Okay. 1 to 2 puffs every 4 to 6 hours when required. Okay. If it is... Short, act, uh, short acting muscarinic antagonist, then that is ipratropium bromide, that is 20 to 40 micrograms to puff up to four times a day whenever it's required. Okay, so this is how you're going to start the treatment. Now, this is the first line of the treatment. After this, what we do is we'll have to see for the FE event value. Okay, the forced expiratory volume in the first second, if it is more than 50%, the treatment is different. 
if it is less than 50 percent the treatment is different okay if it is more than 50 percent that means the patient has still a lot of lot of respiratory sufficiency the respiratory sufficiency is still well maintained so we categorize the patient in to be in either stage one and two now this staging is again depending upon the underlying pathology so that is not important to remember just remember if the fe1 is more than 50 percent it's stage one and two in that case the treatment is either with the long-acting beta 2 agonist or long-acting muscarinic antagonist okay we are not going to add both it's or okay it's or so either we're gonna add salmaterol here or you're gonna add a thiotropium bromide to the patient okay you're not gonna add both okay so salmaterol the dose can be 50 micrograms okay twice daily whereas thiotropium bromide the dose can be 18 micrograms okay one capsule once daily okay doses and all is not that important for, for part one Okay, just remember the drug that is salmaterol is LABA and for LAMA it is thiotropium bromide that is indicated. Now, if the FE even ratio is less than 50%, then the patient falls in the stage 3 and stage 4 category. In that case, what we have to do is if we are adding this long-acting beta agonist, in that case, we'll have to add a steroid to it. So, it is LABA plus inhalational steroids. Okay. Or we are going to add a LAMA itself. Okay. We are going to continue with the long acting muscarinic antagonist. If you are adding this, we will have to add a steroids. Okay. If, the, if that is when FE1 rate is less than 50%. And oral theophylline is recommended only after the trial of these short and long acting bronchodilators. Okay. All else it is not indicated. So only we have tried these short and long acting bronchodilators and the patient is not responding much or to the patients who cannot tolerate or in whom this inhaled therapy is contraindicated. Only in this, those patients will go with the oral theophylline. Okay. Or as oral, oral theophylline is not indicated in a COPD patient. Okay. All right. According to the NICE guidelines, theophylline is something that we will consider in the end. Okay. Like in asthma patient, leukotriene antagonists will consider at the end of the all medication that we have tried. Here, in case of COPD, oral theophylline will consider only when we have tried all the short and long-acting bronchodilators. We have tried the steroids as well. Still, the patient is not responding. Only then we'll go for the oral theophylline. Okay. Don't get confused with this. Okay. And other than this, we can add a mucolytics to the patient, which can be helpful in few patients for the chronic productive cuff. And the drugs are this uh, acetylcysteine or carbocysteine. Okay. And one more thing the NICE guidelines suggest is uh, if you are at the level of SHO or registrar, you cannot prescribe any mucolytic and the mucolytic should be prescribed only under the guidance of a consultant. Okay. That is according to the NICE guideline. So any SHO or registrar is not, should, will not be in a position to prescribe a mucolytic to the COPD or any asthma patient. Okay. Remember this point. Okay. Other than this, the general management, we have to advise the patient on smoking cessation. And one more important is the vaccination here. Every year, the patient has to undergo vaccination for influenza. And one of pneumococcal vaccination every five years should be mandatory in all the patients with COPD. Okay. All right. So any doubts in this management, management of the stable COPD patients? These guidelines are very important. Okay, so how you're going to start the treatment and based on the FE even what medications you are going to add. Okay. I hope that is clear. Okay. There's one more concept of long-term oxygen therapy when it comes to COPD patients. Okay. So this long-term oxygen therapy is indicated to any COPD patients whose partial pressure of oxygen is less than 7.3 kilopascals or 55 mmHg. When the value says less than 7.3, it's not less than or equal to 7.3. This is where they'll try to confuse even the questions. It is less than 7. <coughs> but when it is less than 7.3, that means 7.2 is when you're going to start the oxygen, long-term oxygen therapy. 
If the value is 7.3, you are not going to start the patient on LTOT. All right. If it is 7.2, then you are going to start. So it is less than 7.3. And what if the value is, if the, that, what if the partial pressure of oxygen is 7.3 to 8 kilopascals? Right. What if the value is from 55 to 60 mm Hg? In that case, also you can give long-term oxygen therapy, provided that the patient is having one of these four criteria. That is, the patient should be having secondary polycythemia. We spoke about the secondary polycythemia, right? So because of hypoxia, what happens? There is a raised erythropoietin, and that raised erythropoietin in the body stimulates the RBC production, and the patient go on to develop polycythemia. So that is secondary polycythemia is one criteria. One more thing is the patient should have developed pulmonary hypertension. Okay. Or the patient should have should have nocturnal hypoxemia. Or the patient should have features of call pulmonary, that is peripheral edema. Okay, call pulmonary is one of the complications of COPD. Okay. So if the patient is having any of these four criteria and the partial pressure of oxygen is 7.3 to 8, then even in that condition, you can start the long-term oxygen therapy to the patient. Okay. Or else you're not going to start. If the, for example, if the partial pressure of oxygen is 7.6 and the patient is not having any of these features, then it is not an indication for LTOT. Okay. Less than 7.3 is always an indication to start long-term oxygen therapy. And one more thing we have to remember, the long-term oxygen therapy here, we are giving the supplementary oxygen for at least 15 hours a day. Okay. And it should not be exceeding more than 18 hours a day. Okay. So the duration for LTOT is 15 hours. Okay. okay. And when do we need a surgery in a patient of COPD? So mainly the surgery that we need is the lung volume reduction surgery. So that is indicated if the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is more than or equal to 7.4. Okay. They will try to play with the values in the exam. So remember, it is less, more than or equal to 7.4. So if, even if it is 7.4, you are going to offer up, you are going to refer the patient for the volume reduction surgery. Okay. It's not more than 7.4, it's more than or equal to 7.4, you are going to refer the patient for surgery. Other than this, if the patient is having severe limitation of exercise capacity despite maximal therapies, predominant upper lobe emphysema if the patient is having and the patient's symptoms are worsening or persistent despite the pulmonary rehab. In that case, again, you are going to refer the patient for lung volume reduction surgery. Okay. And the oxygen saturation target for an acutely ill patient in COPD is 94 to 98%. Sorry, for the acute ill patients. If the patient is at a risk of hypercapnia, that is in a COPD patient, in that case, the oxygen saturation can be maintained from 88 to 92%. Okay, there's no need to be giving extra oxygen to the patient. Okay, so 88 to 92% is considered to be safe if the patient is having any risk of hypercapnia. Okay, all right. Would anybody like to answer this question? So here, 65-year-old woman with a history of COPD is admitted to the ER with breathlessness. This is her first admission with an exacerbation of COPD. Okay, blood gas is taken in the room. Room air shortly after the admission are as follows. Okay, so partial piece of oxygen is 8.8, carbon tax is 4.9, pH is 7.38. Okay, what should be the target oxygen saturation be here? Okay, what do you think the answer is? Would anybody like to answer? All right. What do you think the answer is A or B? 94 to 98 or 88 to 92? The answer is 90. Okay, 94 to 98. And why not 88 to 92? We just saw that in the previous slide that if the yes the patient is acutely unwell and one more thing if you see the partial pressure of carbon dioxide here is 4.9 if that value was more than 5 then 
there could have been a risk of hypercapnia. In that case, we could have considered 88 to 92 percent of maintaining the saturations. Or else, in acutely ill patients, we'll have to go for 94 to 98 percent itself. Okay. And for the oxygen uh, supplementation, according to the NICE guidelines, they say to use a 28 percent venturi mask at four liters per minute. Okay. And we can escalate this as the patient needs. All right. Okay. So when, which one of the following is the main criteria for determining whether the patient with COPD should be offered LTOT? What is the answer here? I try to keep the questions very simple so that the basic things you understand well in this session. Okay. That what is the answer here? Would anybody like to answer? Right, right. If the uh, partial pressure of oxygen is less than 7.3, you'll have to consider long-term oxygen therapy, right? Yes, that was an easy question. Yes. Okay, yeah. So here you are reviewing a patient with COPD who remains breathless despite using a salbutamol inhaler required. His FE1 is 60%. There's no history of asthma, eosinophilia, or FE1 variation. Okay, what is the most appropriate next step? What do you think the answer is? Okay, so the patient is having COPD and he is on salbutamol now, right? And the FE1 ratio is 60. Okay, uh, why do you think is uh, option B? Okay, I said you something, right? See, the inhalation of steroids is something you would like to think in the end, right, when the patient is not responding well. That is when if the FE1 is less than 50% and the patient is in stage 3 and stage 4, that is when you go on to add a steroids to the long-acting beta agonist or else it is not indicated. So if it is more than 50%, it is we are going to add a long-acting beta agonist and long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Okay, Either it is and or it is or, right? So the none of the other options tells you about the adding either of these two options. So we can go for option E. Option E is the right answer here. Okay. And one more thing, uh, if a COPD patient has any asthmatic features or any features suggestive of steroid responsiveness, in that case to LAPA we can add a steroids. And if the patient remain breathless or have an exacerbation, then we can even offer a triple therapy. That is LABA, LAMA, as well as inhalational steroids. Okay. And if the patient is already taking the short-acting muscarinic antagonist, we can discontinue that and switch on to again a short-acting beta agonist. And we can use these combined inhalers whenever possible, according to the NICE guidelines. Right. Okay. And theophylline, like I said, has to be given only after all the trials of short acting, short acting and long acting bronchodilators is done. And one more important uh, this uh, thing that they'll ask in the exam is the uh, whenever you are prescribing theophylline to the patient and they have been co-prescribed with the other antibiotics like macrolides or fluoroquinolones, it can exacerbate the side effects of the theophylline. Why? Because for example here, macrolides are the enzyme inhibitors, right? Even quinolones can be, can act as an enzyme inhibitors, mainly the ciprofloxacin. Here, azithromycin or erythromycin, both are enzyme inhibitors. So because of this enzyme inhibition, the adverse effects of theophylline is, the chances of patient getting adverse effects of theophylline toxicity is quite high. So what are the important uh, adverse effects of theophylline? The patient can develop hyperkalemia, arrhythmia. Okay, so and these two are the most common cause of death in case of theophylline toxicity. Okay, this question is also have been asked many times as a part of pharmacology. So remember, along with theophylline, these 
antibiotics are contraindicated. Okay. All right. And there's one more concept of this non-invasive ventilation. So it should be considered in almost all the patients of COPD who present to the uh, ER in the first 60 minutes. And that is all these patients in, in whom respiratory acidosis persists despite the maximal medical therapy. So it has to be considered in all these patients because the respiratory acidosis can sometimes persist even after the maximal medical therapy. And the other indication for this NIV is the pH value that is 7.25 to 3.5. Even this value is very important. If the pH is less than 7.25, then it is a definitive indication that the patient is still having respiratory acidosis and an indication for the intubation of the patient. If the pH is from 7.25 to 3.5, then we'll go for non-invasive ventilation. Okay, not intubation. Okay, and if the patient is having any type 2 respiratory failure, which is secondary due to other chest wall deformities or neuromuscular diseases or any obstructive sleep apnea. Then if the patient is having a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which is non-responsive to CPAP, okay, or weaning from the tracheal intubation, in that case, non-invasive ventilation can be considered. Okay. Remember the remember this value. Okay. pH 7.25 to 3.5, go for non-invasive ventilation. Less than 7.25, go for invasive ventilation. The patient should be intubated. Okay. All right. Okay, Church Strauss syndrome. So, what do you know about this Church Strauss syndrome? Okay. So, this is one of the vasculitis condition. Okay, one of the unca associated vasculitis. Okay. So, here what happens is uh, it's an autoimmune condition, okay, where there will be a vasculitis involving two or more organs. And here the patient can develop even the asthmatic features. Okay, so here you can get a history of a patient where the patient is asthmatic since childhood. Okay, the patient is on all the bronchi bronchodilators and steroids and his asthma symptoms are well controlled. Suddenly when he gets into adulthood, it's not, uh, the doctors are unable to manage his symptoms where in spite of adding all the medications, the, the symptoms are still persisting and the patient is not responding to any of the bronchodilators or steroid inhalers or any of the treatment modalities that we have. In that case, Churchill syndrome is something that we can consider as one of the important differential diagnosis. Okay. So, difficult to treat asthma, Churchill syndrome is one of the important differential. Okay. So, when it comes to difficult to treat asthma, the first thing is Churchill syndrome. Second thing is the patient is not aware how to use the inhalers. Okay. Patient is unaware of the right technique of the inhalation. That is one more thing. Okay. And yes. And here in case of Churchill syndrome, uh, along with asthma, there are other uh, features that have to be there for you to diagnose the patient to be having Churchill syndrome. The patient should have eosinophilia, which should be more than 10%. Usually in case of as asthma patient, we see this level to be more than 4%. Whereas here, we would want the eosinophilia to be more than 10%. Patient will have features of mononeuropathy or polyneuropathy, where the patient can present with the acute flaccid weaknesses or any nerve palsies. Okay? And the patient can have migratory or transi transitory pulmonary infiltrates. Okay? This can be picked up by the haziness on the chest X-ray. The patient can have history of any paranasal sinus abnormalities. Okay. Other than that, if there is any, if we do any biopsies of the blood vessels, they can be extravascular eosinophilic infiltrates. So presence of all these features makes the Churchill syndrome as a as the possible diagnosis. And one more thing is we see that here it is P anka positive. Okay. It is an autoimmune condition. Okay. And the treatment for Churchill syndrome is we have to add the patient on steroids, high dose steroids, and plasma exchange. So these are the only two available options. And the prognosis is not that good in case of Churchill syndrome. All right. Okay. Any doubts till now? Any doubts in COPD? I try to keep it simple and have tried to cover the topics which is mainly asked in the exams recently okay there's no uh, no point in going through the in details of all the copd as aspects from the textbook and which is not going to help you for your exams 
So these are the things that are important when it comes to the clinical aspects and your exams as well. Okay. All right. So coming to the next topic, uh, pneumothorax is a pneumothorax is a condition where there is a collection of air uh, outside the lung, but within the pleural cavity. That is the air gets collected between the parietal and the visceral pleura inside the chest, and this accumulated air can apply pressure onto the lung, and the lung can collapse. Right. So here, when it comes to pneumothorax, we have got types. That is, it can be closed or open or tension pneumothorax. Open neuro uh, pneumothorax is nothing but uh, where there is an open wound on the chest and the air circulates freely here in and out of the chest wall. Okay, that is open pneumothorax. Close is when the amount of air entering the pleural cavity does not increase. It remains uh, how much the volume is. The lung is collapsed and here there is no trauma or there is no entry point onto the chest wall. Okay, it, here it is mainly because of some pathology involved with the lung. Tension pneumothorax is when the air accumulates and it keeps on increasing and it in turn causes the extreme tension within the chest wall and hence the name tension pneumothorax. Okay, there's one more classification that is a uh, spontaneous pneumothorax or the traumatic pneumothorax. Spontaneous, also known as simple pneumothorax, it can be primary or secondary. Primary is when there is no other underlying lung disease. Okay. Secondary is when you are having any underlying lung disease. Okay. Traumatic is when there is a definite history of trauma and the pneumothorax is a consequence of that. Okay. And this both spontaneous and traumatic pneumothorax can go on to develop a tension pneumothorax always. Okay. More common with the traumatic chest injury and the patient who were on mechanical ventilation. In those, having a tension pneumothorax chance is much higher than the spontaneous or simple pneumothorax patient. Okay. A few important symptoms and signs that we see in case of pneumothorax is science-wise, uh, you will have tachycardia, you will have tachypnea, hypoxia, hypotension, and tracheal deviation. Okay. Tracheal deviation is important. It can be picked up on your clinical examination, also on the chest x-ray. Symptoms, patient can have pleuritic chest pain or shortness of breath and cough and fever is quite less common. So pleuritic chest pain is something that you can see here, though it is also seen in pulmonary embolism patient as well. So this kind of pleuritic chest pain with a shortness of breath and the imaging modalities with this, we are going to diagnose the pneumothorax. Whereas in X-ray can be completely normal in case of a pulmonary embolism patient, right? See here, you can definitely find the evidence of a presence of air within the chest cavity of the X-ray. So that will help us to differentiate the whether it is pulmonary embolism or the pneumothorax when the patient is presenting with just with a pleuritic chest pain and difficulty in breathing. Okay. All right. So this is important. The next two slides. Okay, the management part. Okay, so how you are going to manage when it is primary pneumothorax and how you are going to manage when it is secondary pneumothorax. Okay, now a primary pneumothorax is when, when there is no underlying lung pathology, right? And secondary pneumothorax is when it has occurred because of some other consequence of some other medical condition. Okay, related or unrelated to the lung pathology, that is secondary. Okay, so primary pneumothorax, you see that the rim of air is less than 2 cm, okay, and the patient is not having any shortness of breath, okay, then what you're going to do, as it is less than 2 cm, and the patient is not having symptoms, you can just discharge the patient and you can review the patient in your clinic in about 2 to 3 weeks, simple. If the patient is not symptomatic, there's nothing much to worry, provided it is less than 2 cm, okay. Now, if the same uh, patient was asymptomatic, but it was more than 2 cm, then aspiration could have been needed. See, aspiration should be attempted if it is more than 2 cm or if the patient was symptomatic. Right? That is the second point. Now, you have undergone aspiration. You have done an aspiration of the uh, Aspiration is different. Drain, drainage is different. Right? I hope you understand the difference. Aspiration is you insert a wide bore needle and you aspirate the air from the thoracic cavity. Drain is when you put a chest tube, uh, you insert a chest tube and you place it over there and you allow the air to be drained out of the chest. Okay, that is drainage. So once the aspiration fails, okay, and you see that the 
air uh, rim of air is more than 2 cm of still the patient is short of breath then chest strain should be the next option okay all right and if following the aspiration if the rim of air is less than 2 cm and the breathing has improved then we can discharge the patient and consider him for the outpatient review okay so two things we have here less than 2 cm more than 2 cm less than 2 cm see for the symptom patient is asymptomatic then discharge and re review him in about 2 to 3 weeks if the patient is symptomatic you will go for aspiration simple and when it is more than 2 cm you have to aspirate the patient next point if the aspiration fails go for the drainage okay now if the patient is in secondary pneumothorax patient age is more than 50 and rim of air we see is more than 2 cm and the patient is short of breath then chest strain should be inserted okay if aspiration aspiration should be attempted only if the rim of air is from 1 to 2 cm okay and if it is less than 1 cm then we can give the patient oxygen and admit the patient and observe at least for 24 hours there is no point of discharging the patient back to home in case of secondary pneumothorax Please remember that. Okay. So, how you're going to identify secondary pneumothorax? Patient will have history of some other lung pathologies. Simple. For example, patient might have had a history of COPD. Now he has been admitted in the hospital for COPD and he develops a pneumothorax. So, here pneumothorax is because of the underlying COPD condition. So, you are considering that pneumothorax is secondary pneumothorax. So, in that case, the management would be with this protocol, not with this. Okay. So, first you have to identify that is primary, secondary and then comes the treatment part. Secondary pneumothorax, you are never going to discharge a patient back home. Okay, even if the rim of air is less than 1 centimeter, patient is asymptomatic, still you are going to admit the patient at least for 24 hours, administer oxygen and observe the patient. If it is from 1 to 2 centimeter, go for respiration. More than 2 centimeter, go for drainage. Right? I hope that makes it easy. Okay, coming to uh, surgical uh, options, okay, uh, mainly we'll go for this VAT surgery, video assisted thoracic surgery these days. So these are indicated if the patient is having this ipsilateral pneumothorax, which is the second time occurrence. And if the patient is having spontaneous pneumothorax, but that is bilateral and spontaneous hemothorax, collection of blood within the cavity, within the thoracic cavity and persistent air leak despite five to seven five to seven days of drainage and certain occupations like like in pilots and drivers will go for this bad surgery okay one breath so here okay what do you think his answer is go through the question as a medical FI2 on call, you are summoned to the ER to see a 25-year-old man whose condition has suddenly deteriorated. He arrived about 45 minutes earlier with a two-hour history of central pleuritic type of chest pain okay, and breathlessness. He collapsed while waiting to go to a radiology department. He is now agitated and cyanosed. Heart rate is 1 to 8, PP is 76-40, saturation 76, present patient breathing with a high flow oxygen by the rebreathing mask. On respiratory examination, you hear reduced breath sounds in the right lung field and there is a deviation to trachea to the left. Okay. So, what is the diagnosis here? Patient collapses suddenly. Pneumothorax. Reduced, reduced breath sound on the right side. Yes. The diagnosis is pneumothorax. pneumothorax. So, how would you like to manage? Here, the patient doesn't look to be hemodynamically stable. Yes. So, patient is not hemodynamically stable. BP is less. Heart rate is more. Right? Saturation is less. So, you have to manage him immediately on an emergency basis by a large bore needle aspiration. Okay? That is done on the right second intercostal space. Yes. He is the right answer. Okay. Now, coming to the next topic, that is pulmonary embolism. Okay. So, when it comes to pulmonary embolism, there is something known as Wells criteria that is very important for the diagnosis. I will come to that. Okay. So, basically the risk factors uh, for pulmonary embolism would be patient having a DVT or previous DVT or previous embolism. Patient is having any active malignancies or has undergone recent any surgery or has been hospitalized, hospitalized or he has been immobilized in long duration. He has had any lower limb trauma, right? Or the patient is pregnant or in the 
postpartum period of first six weeks. Okay, there's something known as Virco Strat, uh, which tells that uh, if the which includes reduced blood flow, blood vessel injury, and increased coagulability. So these three can contribute to the pulmonary embolism. So in reduced blood flow, we have atrial fibrillation, long distance travel, varicose vein, any venous obstruction, arterial or venous insufficiencies. Right? Blood vessel injury can be in the form of trauma or any major surgeries, hypertensive patient or any invasive procedures. And coagulability increases in case of sepsis, smoking, coagulation disorders and malignancies. So these th things can contribute to the formation of an embolus in the pulmonary arteries. When it comes to symptoms, the most common symptom the patient can have is a dyspnea. Okay. Following that, the pleuritic chest pain is something that is also quite common. Okay. Other than that, the patient can have cough, syncope, right? Hemoptysis and substernal chest pain. Okay. Pleuritic chest pain is quite common. Substernal chest pain is quite rare. And hemoptysis, yes, if it is present, then it is one of the definitive point towards pulmonary embolism, but it's not that common when we see clinically and in science tachypnea it will be there in almost all the patients okay tachycardia can be there okay sign of dvts and fever and cyanosis something we have to see for okay so what happens is in 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 case of pulmonary embolism uh, the jvp can be increased okay and that happens because of the right ventricular stress or dysfunction or the right ventricle get dilated because of the backward flow of the pressure from the pulmonary artery Right, because of that, if the JVP is increased, the stroke volume can be reduced, which in turn reduces the cardiac output, which in turn reduces the blood pressure and increases the heart rate. Okay, other than that, the patient can be in respiratory alkalosis because of the increased respiratory rate, right, and the reduced oxygen supply to that particular lung tissue can result in the infarction of the lung, which can result in the hemoptysis. Okay, so hemoptysis is because of this infarction and in lab values we see reduced rbc reduced uh, platelet okay that tells us about the underlying coagulopathy right and brain natriuretic peptide can be elevated if the patient has developed right ventricular failure okay in early stages patient can present with respiratory alkalosis but again patient can go into respiratory acidosis in the later stages okay so alkalosis is only in the early stages of the pulmonary embolism and d dimer uh, is also is, is quite important here in case of pulmonary embolism it tells us about the fibrinolysis okay so coming to this uh, important wells scoring system okay so in well scoring what we have is we take into consider consideration of all these criteria and to each criteria we give a certain point and we see how likely is the patient is having pulmonary embolism because in pulmonary embolism, there is no definitive test for us to confirm that the patient is having pulmonary embolism. We have to mainly go for CT pulmonary angiography, right? So in NHS, it's quite an expensive procedure for a patient to undergo. So the importance of well score is quite high here. So that is the reason why they want you to know about the well score very well. Okay, so if the patient is having any signs and symptoms of DVT or any clinical signs of DVT, then we give three points to that. When the, according to the signs and symptoms, pulmonary embolism is the most likely diagnosis, then three more points. If the patient is tachycardic, then 1.5. Patient is having any history of immobilization or any surgical history in the last four weeks, then 1.5 points. Prior DVT or prior pulmonary embolism, then 1.5. Hemoptysis, presenting with the hemoptysis one and active malignancy or treatment within the last six months for any active malignancy scores one point. And in this, if you see the points are from less than four, then pulmonary embolism is quite unlikely. Okay, if it is more than four, then pulmonary embolism is a likely diagnosis. Okay, so you have to remember this for your exams. Okay, so based on this scoring, we are going to proceed what investigations to do, what treatment we are going to do. Okay, we'll come to that. And in D-dimer, when we do D-dimer, if the level is less than 500, it excludes the pulmonary embolism. And remember, D-dimer is not a definitive test for the pulmonary embolism. It just helps us to exclude the pulmonary embolism. Right? If Even if, even if the D-dimer is high, it is not a definitive 
positive indication that the pulmonary patient is having pulmonary embolism because DDMR can be elevated even in some other conditions as well. Okay, so if the value is less than 500, it helps us to exclude the possibility of pulmonary embolism. Okay, so basically what happens whenever there's a clot formation, clot formation, there is a lot of fibrin formation, right? So there is a plasmin formed in our blood. That plasmin helps us to degrade this fibrin in order to counterattack the clot formation. And the fibrin degradation products is what the D-dimer is. Okay, so D-dimer is a part of this fibrin degradation products. Okay. So we saw the well score, right? I told you if it is more than four, if the points are more than four, then it is likely that the patient is having pulmonary embolism. In that case, we'll go, go on to do a CT pulmonary angiography to the patient. Okay, so CTPA is indicated if the value is more than four and after CTPA, we diagnose pulmonary embolism, then we have to treat the pulmonary embolism. Okay, now this CTPA is contraindicated if the patient is having any contrast allergy, or if the patient is having a severe chronic kidney disease. Okay. In that case, we can go for ventilation and perfusion scanning. And one more thing, CTP is contraindicated in case of pregnancy. If the patient is pregnant, if it's a female patient, go with the VQ scan. Okay, perfusion, ventilation, perfusion scanning, we have to go for. Okay. When it comes to treatment, we have to see whether the patient is stable or the patient is unstable. When the patient is stable, we have to offer an anticoagulation to the patient and if this anticoagulation is contraindicated, we'll go for an IVC filter. IVC filter are these tiny devices which are placed within the blood veins, okay, which helps to filter the clots. So it acts like a filtration chamber between the right side of the heart and the blood coming throughout the body to the, to the right side of the heart. Now, this anticoagulation is when the patient is stable. What if the patient is unstable? So when whenever the patient is unstable, it indirectly tells us that the patient is having massive pulmonary embolism or the patient is having right ventricular dysfunction. In that case, we have to go for the thrombolysis. That is with the tissue plasminogen activators. Okay. If the tissue, tissue plasminogen activators are contraindicated, then we'll go for a embolectomy. Okay. Then we'll go for embolectomy. The role of TPAs are the tissue plasminogen activators helps us to convert the plasminogen into plasmin. Again, this plasmin helps us to degrade this fibrin and it is degraded into fibrin degradation products. So indirectly, TP helps us to deform the clots that is formed in the blood vessels. Okay. So the important uh, TPAs that we have is tenecteplase, atiplase and reteplase. Okay. Okay, so which anticoagulants do we use? We can go for uh, ultra-fractionated uh, heparin, okay? That is in the hospitalized patient for the IV infusion, where they need an IV infusion. Or if the patient want it on an OP basis uh, and are okay with the subcutaneous injections uh, on a visit basis, in that case, we can go for low molecular weight heparins. And direct oral anticoagulants can be considered if the patient if, if it is in need for long-term anticoagulation and the patient wants it on an OP basis, in that case, Depicatron, Rivaroxaban, or Epixaban can be offered to the patient. Okay. And profile access wise, we have to provide patient with the subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin and proper ambulation, compression bandage, and support to care with the vasopressor or oxygen therapy or with the IV filters. Okay. Any doubts here in pulmonary embolism management? So treatment is based on the well scoring. Okay, if the well score is more than four, then directly go with the CTPA, then treat the pulmonary embolism. Okay, if not this, go for VQ scanning. Okay, treatment, if it is stable anticoagulation, patient is unstable, go with the thrombolysis. Thrombolysis contraindicated, go with the embolectomy. That is catheter embolectomy is what we do. Okay, all right. Okay, 24-year-old medical student has been complaining of a few months history of shortness of breath on exertion and of coughing up blood once. She had few days away from her final examination and spoke 20 cigarettes per day. She takes no medication except for the OC pills. Her only past medical history of note is DVT after a long flight from Australia. Okay, so the patient has history of flight travel here, right? Patient has a risk factor for pulmonary embolism or a DVT, right? Clot formation because of the OCP use. Patient has a risk factor of smoking, right? Then what else? 
Now the patient has features, symptoms of shortness of breath on exertion, coughing of blood once. So all these clinical features and the hist risk factor history tells you that the patient can be having a pulmonary embolism. Right. Yeah. So pulmonary embolism was the answer here. Okay, here. Your first group to see a 50-year-old woman on a medical ward. She has she was admitted earlier that day with a swollen lower left leg after her return from a holiday in Australia. Her D dimers were raised and she was started on IV and fractionated heparin. Okay. She is now short of breath, pale, climbing, tachycardic, and hypotensive. Her ECG shows sinus tachycardia. F1 has given her IV fluids, but her blood pressure is continuing to fall. Okay. What would you consider doing next? Okay, what would be the answer here? So the patient has a history of travel, right? Okay, yeah, thrombolysis is the right answer. So the patient has history of travel here. So the patient clearly had developed a pulmonary embolism. She has been treated. Now she's again become breathless. She's pale, tachycardic, hypotensive. So she, is, she might be having a massive thromboembolism, massive pulmonary embolism here, right? So she's hemodynamically unstable. So a hemodynamic unstable patient will go with the thrombolysis with the TPS. So D was the right answer. Right. Okay. Any questions or any doubts? Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed the session and you can use these slides for your exam preparation for these particular topics. Okay, and I try to make, keep it very short and, and keep it exam oriented. Okay, I hope it was helpful. Okay, if you have any doubts, okay, we can clarify or we will end the session. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you, everyone.